Jane, thank you so much for attending. So today I get to talk about a couple of things that I really, really like. Um, one is CIREC, one is Galileos and implant direct implants. Today's goal is to talk about how, how all they sort of talk nice to each other. Um, we talk about this as CIREC Galileos integration. And uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of different guides um, that we use and how we do guided surgery and ultimately the final restoration with these three systems. So I'm August. Um, I hopefully know a lot of you. Um, I graduated back uh, in 97 from the University of Washington. Um, I went to, uh, I did a, a GPR residency where I learned how to place implants. Um, I'm co-owner of a, a really fun website called vigilenamel.com, so you should check it out. Um, we offer the website for the low, low price of free. Um, you don't have to log in or have a password. Um, I specialize sort of on the implant end of things, and my partner, Todd Ehrlich, specializes more on the digital dentistry point of view, um, inlays, onlays, crowns, and all that kind of good stuff. And you can like us on Facebook as well, um, and which is actually kind of an easier way to go. So whenever I lecture, I like to start with a super easy case. And one of the things about uh, being a general dentist at implants is it's easy to get overwhelmed or discouraged from placing implants. There are so many sites in the mouth that are super easy to work with. You don't have to do an upper second molar with no bone. Um, there's so many patients in your practice right now that are edentulous that are partially edentulous that could benefit from getting an implant and utilizing CIREC and Galeos and implant direct implants really make everything super duper easy. So if you look at this case here, we have tooth number five, um, tons of attached tissue. We design the crown, we reverse engineer the position of the implant based on where the crown should be. We place a scan post, we design a screw retain restoration, be that in Emacs or in zirconia, um, and place the final restoration. This is all super easy stuff, well within the wheel well of any general dentist out there. But first I wanna to talk to you about some of my early implant cases I did before I started doing Syrah and Galeas. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But that being said, these three images, although they are ridiculous, do show some problems we have placing implants. If a patient comes to me with tooth number 30, um, I can do that freehand. I mean, that's a pretty easy case to do. But once we get into edentulous cases or large spans with multiple implants, uh, things get a little out of the way. So if you look at the picture on the upper left-hand side, we have, well, a lot of implants that aren't exactly parallel. Um, guided surgery, utilizing your CIREX scan and using Galileos together, it's very, very easy to get these implants parallel if you want them, or not parallel if you're doing an all-on-four type approach. So it's very easy to just space things out, um, figure out where the final restoration will be, and place your implants accordingly. If we look at the lower left-hand side of the screen, we look like maybe we got just a little too close to that molar. Um, one of the things that um, I speak about a lot is avoiding anatomy. And you can really see in this picture that, well, we didn't really avoid the anatomy here, did we? Uh, we actually got in the middle of the tooth there. Um, and it, although this is an extreme example, look, it's really easy to get close to adjacent teeth, especially in the lower anterior. If we look to the lower right-hand side of the screen, you can see a somewhat ridiculous problem, but a problem we face as restorative dentists. Someone placed the implant where they thought the bone would be, and we are ending up in sort of a difficult restorative position. Um, doesn't work like that anymore. We start with the Galileo scan, we start with a CIREX scan, we design our crown first and reverse engineer the position of the implant based on the ideal restorative position. Or 
if the patient doesn't have enough bone, we can stop for a second and say, hey, look, we don't have bone in the right position here. We really need to stop and do grafting. Or if the patient denies grafting, we've informed the patient. There's a great saying, if you tell a patient something before you do it, it's called information. If you tell a patient after you do it, it's called information. So I've done, well, maybe not this bad of, of an implant placement in the past, but I've been faced with this awkward conversation with my patients as to why their crowns don't look like their natural teeth. And in the past, I've used the excuse of, well, it's an implant crown. Well, patients don't buy that anymore. Um, we have better grafting uh, capabilities and better soft tissue and hard tissue grafting capabilities to where that's not a valid excuse. So we should be making our implants look like teeth and we should be informing our patients of the options that we have. So why are most of my cases done guided? Well, because I'm the restorative dentist, I'm selfish. Uh, when the patient comes back ready to restore, I wanna make sure that my time using the CIRAC machine is not in what we call tool wonderland. I'm not gonna sit here and design my crown for 20 minutes. I want to scan the scan post, get it in there, and have a nice proposal. And how I restore in the posterior is different than how I restore in the anterior. In the posterior, I want my implant to draw with the adjacent teeth contacts. I want it to be in the center of the ridge, and if I had my way, I'd like to do a screw retain crown. So in order to do a screw retain crown, the internal connection and I prefer the legacy line of implants from Implant Direct, so that's an internal hex. That internal hex has to draw with the adjacent teeth. If it doesn't draw with the adjacent teeth, I've got a problem in trying to seat that restoration. What's really cool about the Galileo software is that I can plan my implant, look at the adjacent contacts, and alter my implant platform based on that, or I can stop for a second, go back to the mouth, and then alter the adjacent teeth contact so that draws. Now in the anterior, we have a different clinical situation. In the anterior, we are constantly starving for buckle bone. We normally just don't have enough. So we tend to place our implants a little more palatal than we do in the posterior. So we have to balance our palatal placement with getting some sort of a, a good restoration and not impinging too much on the lingual portion of our restoration. So the nice thing about CIRAC and Galileos is that I can plan everything. I can look at everything before I even start and know what my limitations are. And if I have to, I can stop and say, hey, look, we don't have enough bone to do this. So we have a couple of choices. We can live with an non ideal restorative situation. We can send you to grafting. Or worst case scenario, we can live with a bridge. Um, I know that's kind of a taboo to say, but sometimes a bridge is a better restoration than an implant. And we can evaluate everything ahead of time and not have this awkward talk after we place the implant and note that our implant is non-restorable. So what are my implant sequences? So I'm a garden variety general dentist. So I do DO composites the exact same way. I do root canals the exact same way. And whether it's an edentulous case or it's a single unit case, I do implants the exact same way. First things first, take a look under the hood, do an oral exam, see if you can do an implant. There's a lot of signs that you can look for in the mouth before you start with a comb beam or do anything else to make sure that this patient is right for implants. The next step, figure out how to get a tooth in there. Whether I'm doing a crown proposal in CIRAC or I'm duplicating the patient's denture 
and doing what we call a radiographic guide, I can figure all this stuff out ahead of time. We scan the patient and we plan the patient. And a lot of times, and I'll talk about this later on, I sit down with the patient and make sure that the patient looks at the scan and we plan the case together. Finally, we do the surgery. Um, the surgery, I gotta tell you, is really anticlimactic. Because we've run through everything in the Galileo software, I know exactly what's going on. And typically, my surgeries, if I have the guide made for a single unit, we're looking at 10 or 15 minutes. For multiple units, definitely under an hour. One of the great things about CIRAC and Galileos is I know exactly what I'm going to do after the surgery. Am I gonna cover everything up and do this as a two-stage surgery? Or am I going to do some sort of a temporary or even a final restoration? I can figure all that stuff off at the original exam or the oral exam. I'm not gonna bore you with basic implant numbers, but the two real implant numbers that sort of appeal to me are the distance from the implant platform to the CEJ and the implant platform to the base of the adjacent tooth contact. So we've all restored implants that looked kind of weird, right? The implant platform is a little too coronal and we've been faced with building up a crown from the implant platform to the adjacent teeth contacts very abruptly. So looks like a pumpkin on a stick, doesn't it? So the perfect or the ideal distance from the implant platform to the proposed CEJ should be about three to four millimeters. We need room to build up the emergence profile. Another variable that we need to keep track of is the implant platform to the base of the adjacent tooth contact. So if we want to really build up an implant platform, one would think the lower is the better, and that's not true. The more apical you place your implant, you run the risk of recession and having uneven CEJs. And studies have shown that the more you place your implant apical, if you exceed the implant platform distance to the base of the adjacent tooth greater than five millimeters, about 50% of the time you don't get a, a you don't get a papilla. So in essence, you will invite dark triangles if you exceed five millimeters from the base of the, the implant, from the implant platform, sorry, to the base of the adjacent tooth contact. Now, what if your, your patient just doesn't have enough bone. So you can look at the adjacent teeth. If you look at the tooth number not, or eight in this picture, uh, we have a very coronal contact. Look at tooth number 10. You can see that contact is very, very flat. So I am constantly disking the contacts of teeth around my implant to sort of cheat if you will. Um, if I have a very, very flat, broad contact, it's very easy to build papilla. So here's an example where I did not play by my own rules, and I played by my rules later on. So both patients, I did implants on tooth number eight, and we have two very different restorative outcomes. If you look at the image at the top, my implant is placed far too cervically. And you can see a difference in CEJ heights. Whoa, something's crazy going on here. Uh, very different in CEJ heights. So my number eight on the topmost screen um, looks to be about one to two millimeters apical from number nine. Look at the adjacent teeth contacts and the recession you see on tooth number seven. So we don't have a very nice soft tissue profile there. Now look at tooth number eight in the lower screen. Tooth number eight, we have even CEJs and we have fill of papillae both on the mesial and the distal. So I respected, sorry about that. Don't know why that's there. Let's see if we can get rid of 
rid of that. A thousand pardons. <laughs> um, so we have even CEJs, and we have um, Papilla Phil on both of these cases. So here's a, ca a case that, that shows what can happen if you don't pay attention to these. So I had a patient, and I got to tell you, I mean, I do a lot of specialty procedures in my office, and if a specialist gets a patient for me, they're either crazy or I've separated a file. So this patient was the former. Um, nice patient, but nuttier than a fruitcake. So I didn't want to handle her, and I sent her to my oral surgeon. And my oral surgeon extracted number 18 and did an incredible job of, of grafting the socket. He did a little too good of a job, if you can notice on the radiograph on the lower right. The bone is built up all the way to the distal contact of number 19. Now, he placed the implant at the level of that contact, and I gotta tell you, it just does not look good to me. Let's see if I can get rid of this thing here. So, stop it. Oh well, guess not. All right, so, so now I've got to build my uh, restoration from the implant platform to the adjacent teeth contact. And you can see what it looks like. Pumpkin on a stick, right? We have an abrupt building of the contact from the implant platform to the adjacent teeth contact. Now, this is number 18, definitely not an aesthetic zone, but if this was in the anterior, I'd have a real issue. Furthermore, the problem I have is because this surgeon placed the implant too coronally, I have a vertical dimension problem, don't I? So this is a Straumann implant. We have a fairly tall tie base. Look at where the tie base is in relation to the occlusal contact. It is right up there. Um, so this is very unesthetic because my tie base had to be cut down so that I could do it. We're almost at the level of the screw. One of the things that attracted me initially to guided surgery, and I think it attracted a lot of people as well, is the ability to do punches. So when we do punches, we're kind of flying blind, right? We make a little channel in the gingiva and access the bone through a four or five millimeter hole. Um, hard to do that non-guided, but very easy to do guided. Look at the images to your left. Oh my God, that is such a big flap. I mean, I can see the patient's ankles through there. I mean, it's giant. Um, why did I do that? Well, I didn't have a cone beam. And so I wanted to see where all the roofing cavities are. I wanted to see if I needed to add or maybe even cut down bone. On the right, you can see, you know, some punches. Very easy to do this. Um, very easy to remove tissue, takes no time. So one of the great benefits of guided surgery is we can use punches. Now, let me tell you, I probably do punches less than 50% of the time. So when we don't have enough attached tissue, don't wanna do a punch. Because when you do a punch, you just remove good tissue. So you wanna be able to uh, save that good tissue. When you wanna do any sort of grafting or any sort of bone recontouring, you can't do a punch. <clears throat> but that being said, our flaps can be so much smaller since we know the contours of the patient's bone. And a lot of times when I do lay flaps, they're only to move tissue around. So if you look in this example, we have a concavity on the buckle we have a lot of unattached tissue. So I don't want to do a punch because I don't have enough good tissue to start with. So we need to do some sort of crestal incision, right? So usually it's on the center of the ridge. So why not do it towards the palate? If we do it towards the palate, do two vertical releases to the unattached tissue, now I can slide all that good tissue off to the buckle 
we can fill in that defect. But as you can see on the image on the lower right, we now have a very nice area of attached tissue on the buckle of the crown. And so we filled in that defect pretty well. Has anyone out here tried contour healers? Um, I gotta tell you, I love these things. So if you look to the images of your left, we have a cylindrical healing abutment. It does its job and it's great, but we know that crowns don't have a cylindrical profile. So I could spend the big bucks, take an impression and send out for a custom healing abutment, but why? Right, so we can take these contour healers, they're about, I forget what the price is now, about 40 or 50 bucks. You can buy them from any dental supplier or if you can go to contourhealer.com, you can download them as well. But what I do is a month before I'm ready to restore, be it with a PBS impression or a Cirex scan, I go ahead and take out this cylindrical healing abutment, put in a contour healer, and let it do its work for a month. Now I've got a very, very easy situation. If those of you that have restored teeth with Cirex on implants, there's a step called the baseline. And the baseline uh, basically establishes what is subgingival for what is uh, sub or subgingival versus supergingival. Um, and this makes your job so much easier. So these are great. Just contact Shine, Patterson, Pearson, whoever you use, or just go to contourhealer.com. So the gist of this lecture is um, sort of how you can use Cirec and Galios together um, to make things efficiently. And we call that Cirec and Galios integration. So Cirec and Galios integration is how these two machines talk nice to each other. So we scan our patient in Cirec, um, I'd highly recommend if you have an Omnicam, I know it's tougher with the blue cam, but to capture the contralateral tooth. So in this case here, we're doing a implant on number 31. I wanna look at number 18 and get some information about it. So we know we have two curves in the mouth. We have the curve of Wilson and we have the curve of speed. And th those both contribute to how your implant is angled, as well as how your crown is developed. Look at 18. Wow, it's got a really, really steep curve of speed. So if I don't reproduce that in my implant placement, I'm gonna have a difficult time with screw access and also sort of the feel and anterior guidance in my restoration as well. So always try to capture that contralateral too. What about metal noise? Well, uh, Galio systems have a great um, sort of mathematic formula called MARS, so Metal Artifact Reduction Software. And what that basically does is it knows that a photon is coming and hitting some sort of object. With standard teeth, that photon may pass through it and give us a grayscale or be deflected by it, giving us a radio opaque object. But when it comes to metal and also a rotating sensor, we deal with polychromatic photons and they give us all sorts of metal artifacts. So Galeos does a pretty good job of cutting it away, but it's not perfect. So if you look at the image to your left, you can see quite a noisy scan. Look at the image to the right. I've cut away the noise I've replaced it with my Cirex scan, and now I can better plan my case having that good data from Cirex scans. One area where I think Cirex and Galeos is underutilized, but works really well, is when it comes to edentulous cases. So I got this case on the left-hand side from a, a doctor on Dentaltown who had asked me, hey, can you help me out? I said, yeah, sure. And I looked at this and I said, well, everything looks nice and parallel, but I'm not quite sure what you're doing. And he said, well, I am uh, doing a hybrid. And I'm like, well, great. Well, where are the teeth? How do I know what, where the screw holes are coming? Are they coming out the facial or are they coming out the lingual? 
we need that additional data. So enter Cirax. So take the patient's denture, go ahead and scan it up. Um, you can duplicate the patient's denture with barium sulfate and acrylic and scan the patient in Galeos, then match that Cirac denture data with it. Now look at the scan and look at how much data we have. We know exactly where to place our angulation pins. We know exactly where the implants are lined up. I know exactly where the teeth are relative to the implants. So I have so much data now that I can really accurately plan my case. One underutilized function of CIRAC that we've had forever is the um, smile design uh, portion of CIRAC. And if you haven't accessed the smile design portion, you have to go into the options and actually manually activate it. But the smile design portion gives you the ability to take a picture of the patient. You don't need a fancy camera. Just go ahead and use your iPhone or whatever phone you have import that ant into CIRAC, but now what do we have? We have the patient's lips, and this can give us a lot of data on how we're gonna handle the case and how we're gonna restore it. So in this case here, the patient has a relatively moderate lip line, not too bad, but if this patient had a really big lip line, we may be worried about gum recession after placing an immediate implant, or if we're doing a hybrid on this patient, we would want to know where the hybrid flange would end up. If you know the patient that was in that picture, um, that's Dr. Gerald Misnick. Um, he is the founder of Implant Direct. He's the inventor of the internal connection. So prior to Dr. Nisnik, we had external hex implants. He invented the internal connection with his sprue vent implant. And he said, hey, August, I broke number eight off of the gum line. I'm coming in, do an immediate implant. And I said, hey, Dr. Nisnik, hang on a second. Let me put on my brown scrub pants and treat you. You can see here, this is Dr. Nisnik and his idea of guided implant surgery, which is him with a mirror and him guiding my drill. So this is pretty much how the entire appointment went. So what about digital impressioning? You can see on the left-hand side how patients hate digital impressioning. And if you are a CIRAC user, you've known for a long, long time how great digital impressioning really is. So uh, one thing that's especially important in implantology is that unlike a physical impression of a crown prep, we're sort of suggesting where the implant is in space. And this is, you know, just rife with lots and lots of different errors. So by being able to place a scan post and scanning that scan post, we end up with zero distortion. This is super important when you get into hybrids and bigger cases as well, where PBS impression material can contract and give us some sort of discrepancies in our final restoration. So let's talk about a little bit about the different guides that are available from Serona. We have the classic guide, which is sort of the one that started it all. Got to be honest with you, I don't use the classic guide that much. It's typically for edentulous cases or very noisy cases where we have a lot of PFMs or zirconia. An Opti guide is a very easy system to use. Now, I highly recommend it, especially for the newbies. Digital guides are kind of a cool new option where you pay Serona a fee and they give you a file, which is called an STL file. You can either send that to a local lab that has a 3D printer, or if you have a 3D printer, you can print that yourself and save a lot of money. But my favorite guide is the CIRAC Guide 2. And the CIRAC Guide 2 is a chair-side milled surgical guide um, that you can do in your office. It is designed chair side to be single units, but there are some 3D printed options if you send it out to a lab. So let's actually start with the Opti guide because that's the easiest guide to utilize. So with an Opti guide, we start with our CIRAC scan of the patient. So try your best to scan a full arch. We export that file, it's called an SSI file. 
we bring that scan into Galileo's and we, we plan that case within the Galileo software, we then export that case to Germany to the lab CCAT, which is Serona's lab, and they go ahead and plan the case and they make the guide and they mail it back to you. So the Opti guide has six working days, so it takes a little bit of time, but not too bad. Um, but they will go through the case. One of the great benefits of the OptiGuide system is you have a someone in Germany who will look at your case and tell you, hey, wait a minute, this does not look right. You need to sort of change this or that. So let's go over a OptiGuide case. So this case I did, it's number 19 and number 30. We planned a conventional implant on number 19. And number 30, we're planning an immediate implant with a legacy seven millimeter implant. Number 19 is really nothing to write home about. It's a pretty uh, cut and dry system. Um, we wanna make sure our implant draws with the contacts. Again, fairly, fairly easy. However, with number uh, 30, we have an immediate molar. And if anyone has done an immediate molar, they know that in immediate molars, the implant tends to deviate. It tends to go between the mesial or the distal or the palatal root sockets if you're on an upper molar. So try this trick, it's really pretty cool, and you don't have to do it guided at all. Flatten the tooth out, get a, a carbide surgical burr, and drill a big old hole um, it through the fabrication down into the level of bone. And this hole has to be big. It has to be about three millimeters in diameter. But go ahead and just drill right through the tooth. Well, what good thing is going on? Well, as we're drilling through the tooth, the adjacent teeth roots are guiding your implant, just like a surgical guide. The adjacent teeth roots are dentin and they're really hard and they keep that drill centered right into the percation space. So go ahead and go through with your 2.3 and your 2.8 millimeter drills if you're using the legacy system. One thing that's always kind of fun to do is go ahead and put an angulation pin, take an x-ray and email it to your local endodontist with the subject heading, oh my God, I perfed. It's really kind of fun to see what the responses are. When you're done with that, <laughs> go back to the patient and section the tooth and remove those two tooth or teeth roots. Well, what do we have here? Well, we have a hole in our furcation bone. And what that means is now that I go back and I drill into the site, I'm not going to deviate into those root sockets. Place your implant. Um, go ahead and graft around the implant if you have greater than two millimeters of space. Another cool trick, go ahead and cut a hole in your membrane. Um, this is a direct gen membrane and place a, um, place a healing abutment through it. And here's our finals. This patient came to me with his chief complaint is uh, I, my crown fell off, and I'd like for you to re-cement it. Uh, sorry, buddy, we're not gonna do that. So we've got a little bit of a situation here. He had lost his tooth, and he has other issues on the adjacent teeth. So you can see to the mesial, we have a periodontal abscess, um, and we have some teeth that have definitely lost um, some bone around them. So we're gonna go ahead and remove a few of these teeth, um, contour the bone and place some implants. In this case, we're using a pilot guide. One of the hallmarks of a pilot guide is that we have no depth control. And you may ask yourself, well, why do I want no depth control? I mean, that's kind of dumb. I mean, I'm paying the big bucks for a guide. I have a Galileo scan. Why, why is this? So why, well, we don't want depth control. So I don't know where my bone is going to add up and or end up, and I wanna make sure that after I contour the bone that I can place my implant platform exactly where things are. 
as you can see here, our uh, drill or our sleeve is only big enough for the 2.3 millimeter drill. Here we placed our implants, we have contoured our bone. I kind of changed my mind <laughs> about saving uh, what it looks like is tooth number 23. And you can see in the following slides, I took it out. So here's our implants and our tooth went bye-bye. So we took out our tooth. Um, here we have our framework and we have um, our final restoration. And here is our restoration at seating. All right, so let's talk a little bit about digital guides. So the way digital guides work are almost exactly like Opti guides. You scan your patient, you send the file to Germany, Serona designs the case, they take their money, and they ask you, hey, where do, well, where do you want to send this file? Do you want to send it to a lab or do you want to print it yourself? And so you have the option of sending it to a lab or printing it itself. So here's a case where we used a digital guide. In this case, this was sent to a lab. Um, I believe this is Burbank Dental Lab in uh, California. Patient has number eight, nine with some posts. He fell down and both teeth have loose clinical crowns. Uh, we decided to do a little PRF. And so in this case here, we went ahead and drew some blood out on the patient. Um, we extracted the teeth. We mix the PRF uh, with some direct gen MFDBA bone graft, place the two implants. Now, number nine went in nice and solid. Um, number eight uh, was a little bit of a spinner. So I didn't feel comfortable with immediate temporization and we ended up using a flipper. Now, everyone, when you're doing immediate implants and if you're a newbie here, one of the most important things do not promise the patient anything. So tell the patient ahead of time, hey, look, we're gonna do our best. Let's go ahead and take an impression for a flipper and let's have that flipper ready just in case things don't integrate. Don't throw away that guide. And so when things heal up, especially if you're using PRF, that tissue just grows right over the implants and now you've had to play almost like the whack-a-mole game, you have to find your implant. Um, and one of the great things that you can do is place the guide back in, and I love the DECA laser, and I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Implant Direct at one point um, distributed laser, they still have a few less. They are discounting those suckers like a lot. And so if you want a really great laser at a low price, Go ahead and contact Implant Direct. I gotta tell you, I've had this love-hate relationship with lasers. I've used diodes forever, and they just have not had the guts to really uh, make me wanna use them. So I use the DECA, it's awesome. It's like a bazooka. <laughs> so you really have to be a little careful with using it, but it's super duper powerful. So what I just do is I put the guide back in the patient's mouth, shoot a couple of holes through, locate my implants, go back with the laser, uncover, and I love this burr. And I'm sorry I don't have the Pearson or the Shine product codes from this burr, but this is a Meisinger carbide. It's the shape of a chamfer burr, and I love this for like everything. So I run it dry and I contour the tissue, and I really make the tissue look sort of sulcus-like. I also use, use this to contour adjacent teeth, to get a better um, contact area as well. I also use it on my preps as my final burr. I like it better than a fine diamond. It really shines up the prep as well. So this is a great burr to have. So here we've contoured the area. We just threw some old legacy two abutments or legacy three abutments on there. We milled out in Cirec um, some teleocad temporaries. Uh, we ended up bleaching his teeth. Uh, we kept those margins kind of high and dry because I want to make sure the tissue grows nice. And here we are a few weeks later on. So you can see we've gone from a very flat profile to now having some fairly pointy papilla. And here's our final restorations.
So quickly, I want to go through an edentulous case. It looks like I might be running out of time. Um, so I want to get to the CIRAC Guide 2 stuff and some other cool stuff. So here's a classic guide. The hallmark of the classic guide is that we use a bite plate with fiducial markers. So we duplicate the patient's denture, have the lab attach the bite plate to the um, classic guide. We plan the case. You can see those little balls there. Those are the fiducial markers. And the CCAT lab will match up your scan with um, the radiographic guide that you sent to them. One of the most important things about doing a dentalist case is that we can't get a lot of water down into it. So always have irrigation channels on the buckle. And you can just request that from CCAT. So here's our implants. One of the things I do initially, or actually when I'm ready to restore, is take a quick impression with just an abutment level impression coping. The lab is going to make jigs. Um, I loot those jigs in the mouth and do a pickup impression with a, a custom tray. You may be asking, why did you not do this with uh, an in-lab system with um, Scan posts, well, this is a little bit before, but I gotta tell you guys, I really kind of like the analog nature of hybrids. I wanna see where the tissue is. I wanna kind of get things fit. If anyone's here has done a digital denture, um, it's really a combination of digital and PBS impressioning. Here's our pickup impression. One thing that's very important about edentulous cases is that we uh, pick up these cylinders in the patient's mouth. Um, these cylinders are about $30 each from Implant Direct. If you poke two holes in your radiographic guide um, and make sure that everything sits passively around these cylinders, you can inject the space with Luxatemp or acrylic or whatever you want. Don't worry about locking them on. They're fairly sub so there's never really a problem. But what this does is it stabilizes your uh, bite registration and allows you to have a really nice solid bite. This was designed by Custom Direct. Custom Direct is a little known fact about Implant Direct. They have an incredible lab that you can utilize to get these frameworks done for well under $800. Um, I've spent $4,000 in the past getting hybrid frameworks. So this design is called a pond post design. The hallmark of the pond post design is that we have metal just where teeth are. Now, you may be wondering, why am I not doing this in zirconia? Zirconia is like the coolest thing now. Um, I don't like zirconia. I mean, I know everyone does, and I'm probably the lone voice in the woods. But the bottom line is, is the zirconia is fairly opaque. I find the gingiva looks like bubble gum. But one of the things I don't like about zirconia, it's not repairable. So anything goes wrong with this hybrid, I can do a pickup impression and add teeth and add gingiva. It's a fairly easy process. Here's a wax try-in and the ultimate final restoration. You can see how small this hybrid is. And here is the hybrid in the mouth. Now, unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I want to skip over to something that I'm really kind of excited about, which is um, 3D printing. And 3D printing is really kind of cool now with CIRAC that we have the STL export, and we can do some cool things with implantology, like printing CIRAC Guide 2s, uh, printing uh, all sorts of cool stuff. So excuse me for one second, I'm just going to skip ahead and get right to it. Um, yeah, let's go over. So you may look out on the market and say, God, what printer do I, do I get? There's so many different types and there's so many different technologies. And I gotta tell you, there's no one printer right now that's in a good price point that's absolutely perfect. The um, printer you may be most familiar with is an FDM printer. And a printer uh, that uses FDM basically is like a hot glue gun. 
Um, you may see it at Best Buy or you may see it elsewhere. In general, uh, FDM printers are not that accurate. Their average accuracy is 400 microns. And if you think about dentistry, we really need stuff that are around 100 microns. So the, the FDM printers, in my opinion, are just not good enough. Um, the Form 2 is a super popular printer. If you go on Digital Enamel, I've got lots of stuff about F, uh, Form 2 printers. Um, again, it, it's a great one. The Moonray is one that I use primarily. It's what's called a DLP printer that uses a projector um, to print your stuff. It's pretty neat. The future, though, I think is in what's called SLS or selective laser sintering. Um, SLS involves um, using a laser to sinter powder. So imagine we could sinter zirconia or sinter titanium or sinter whatever we want in this type of printer. Right now, uh, basically, the resolution is just not there, but eventually we'll get there. Um, again, if you go to Digital Enamel, I can tell you more and more about it. LCD printers are really pretty cool. They basically use an iPhone screen to cure uh, a vat of liquid composite. Um, one thing that's nice about LCDs is they're usually under $1,000. So LCDs, look out for LCDs, especially printing surgical guides. So what can we 3D print? Well, one thing that I really 3D print a lot is night cards. Um, and night cards are a great way um, to, to get the most out of your Galeos machine as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the details because we're running low on time. But if you look into uh, medical billing, especially using sites like, um, I'm drawing a blank, um, Crossover Dental, um, if you just Google them, Crossover Dental is a great uh, billing service. Um, also, the Z Group um, is another great medical billing service, but they pay a lot, actually, for night guards. Um, basically, medical looks at night guards as a uh, non-dental thing. So if you have a Galios, you really should look into that. We can scan our patients if we're doing a uh, basic flat plane splint. Uh, medical pays for a certain amount for that. When you're scanning your patients in CIRAC, I highly, highly, highly recommend if you're doing any sort of scan where the occlusion is important, you should do that in CIRAC ortho. And so I open the patient up, I scan them in CIRAC ortho, I still use powder in CIRAC ortho, even though I have an Omnicam, um, it's just easier to get my scans. Um, we can actually bring them into Mesh Mixer a uh, mesh mixer is a free software. If anyone's interested, October 20 and 21, I'm doing a 3D printing course in Austin uh, where we go over mesh mixer. And we can print these out for about five bucks a night guard. And sort of this is sort of how it looks. Um, in this case here, we got paid $2,500 from medical for this flat plane splint. Another option that you have is to do an occlusal orthotic. It takes a little bit more time, but you can use the JMT function in Galileos and do basically a range of motion study, and medical does pay that as well. And you can print that out if you want to. And in this case, I got paid about $4,000 for an occlusal orthotic. So definitely a topic for a different webinar, but something you should look into. If you have a patient that has a night guard and has a hole in it, um, one really cool thing that you can do um, is simply scan the night guard in your Galileos machine. So in this patient here, she had a night guard with a hole in it. We scanned it. We ended up printing out her night guard. And here it is. I mean, you can print five night guards. They're about five bucks each. I mean, don't all patients tell you, hey, my dog ate my night guard? Just give one to the dog. Get it over with. But one of the things that I use Syrup and Galileos for a lot outside of the implant realm is aligners. So there's a company called Exceed Ortho 
that basically does everything that Invisalign does, plans your case, and you 3D print um, the individual models and use a pressure former um, to go ahead and make your own aligners. And you've got power ridges, you have attachments, IPR, everything you would normally use. If you wanna use brackets, we certainly have another option too. In this case here, um, we scan the patient, they plan the case, they gave us orthodontic bracket trays and we delivered it to the patient, changing the wires out every three weeks. And we completed this case in about four months. So one other cool thing that you can do with Sirek and Galileo's. A question I get asked a lot is, what about the Blue Sky software? And I noticed we had a lot of people asking about it. The Blue Sky software is certainly nice because it's free. Um, if you wanna, if I, to be totally honest, I'm used to the Sirec and the Galileo software. Um, it's, in my opinion, a little more difficult software to make work. Um, it's definitely hard to get the occlusion um, in it, so I don't usually use it. But if you are a Sirec and Galileo user, what you may not know is that InLab can export to STL. And so you can pay a lab anywhere between 14 to 15 bucks plan the case in Galileo's, any number of units you want. They export it to the STL format. And if you want to print it, you can certainly just print it. Now, some people are saying too, even for single unit CIRAC guides, should I print or mill? Well, some people are printing their guides in under 20 minutes. So that's certainly something to think about and an area of discussion. Here's a six unit Sirac Guide 2 that I printed. I placed some Legacy 2s and some Legacy 3s, and later on I'm going to design some custom healing abutments. If any of you guys know online a guy named Baron Gruder, um, he has a product called the Anatomic Contour Healer, and it does some really cool stuff. But I'm going to close after this one. But I just wanted to tell you, uh, one thing that's very interesting is I've always been told that medical doesn't pay for implants. And I got really busy and I just delegated um, the medical billing to a staff member. We got almost $6,000 on this case billing to medical. And so they paid a, a number of dollars on the bone graft as well as, um, as the implants itself. So. So definitely look into medical billing. It's a great way to get paid for your implant treatment. So on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for some questions. I apologize. I uh, was a little lengthy in my implant. So let's go ahead and, and uh, go for the, the, the questions here. Did your staff take med? No, um, there's, there's actually two camps out there. Um, and I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong, but um, we send out to a service. And so the service is Crossover Dental. Um, I think it's called, yeah, crossoverdental.com. Um, if you do yourself a favor, go online, Google uh, the Z Group and buy their book. It's called the Z Book. And so what I do is um, this Z book has all the soap notes for medical. Um, and my uh, staff just basically uses the, the disc they have. It's a Word document and they alter it and send it over to Crossover Dental. What's nice about Crossover Dental is they take a cut um, and so they see the whole thing through. Now the other school of thought is everything's done in your office and you send out the medical billing. If you have a dedicated person who's really knows how to bill medical, this is a great way to go too. What I know is medical will try not to pay you any time. So I highly recommend using a service. So I'm gonna go down the list here. Um, why do you prefer the moon ray to the form two? Great question, big discussion here. Uh, in a nutshell, the resins are cheaper. Um, it has a higher resolution and it's three times as fast. 
So next one down for implants, uh, direct guided surgery. How do you print the guides so they fit the CIREC2 guides? So when you're in Galeos and you're planning your CIREC guide 2, you export to a file type called CMGDXD. That's the file that you import back into CIREC. Now there's a bunch of labs that will convert that to the 3D printing file format STL. So all you have to do is find a lab. I'll recommend a few here. Express Dental Labs out of Oklahoma. Um, the guy there is Trey Chambers. Uh, Frankie Acosta um, down in San Diego is awesome. Um, Javier Vasquez um, has a great lab, Durrell Dental Studios. Jay Black is another one. Um, all you have to do is find these guys and either email them. If you want to, you can go through CIREC Connect um, and send the file through CIREC Connect through your CIREC. But you shouldn't pay any more than 15 to 50 bucks. So it's a really uh, cheap. And think about this. The resin is going to cost you five bucks. And the let's say the conversion fee is 20 bucks, 25 dollars for a multi-unit CIREC guide versus paying 185 to 300 dollars for some from Serona. So it's definitely a good way to go. Can I use CIREC with your Max system milli guide? Unfortunately, not. Um, CIREC um, will export to STL. Now I don't know what the file format of the Remexis software. If it, if it exports to STL, then you can print that file, but you can't go back to CIREC and do a CIREC guide too. You can only print that out. Now, um, there's lots of different options out there, 3D Diagnostics, uh, Blue Sky Plan, these are different softwares out there that allow you to print, but you can't do it with CIREC guide too. Do you use uh, Austell at all for stability to make a decision? Great question. Um, Austell is a great product. Um, I'm just too cheap to buy it. Um, so what I use is Implant Direct's multi-torque wrench. Um, I use that to determine what my torque value is. At the time of surgery, if it's an anterior tooth or a premolar, and I have greater than 35 Newton centimeters of torque, then I make the decision on whether or not to temporize or not. Um, at the time of restoring, I use the same thing too. Uh, what file type on CIREC do you use to export to custom uh, direct for custom abutments and bars? So if you uh, go on the Implant Direct website, I believe they're up. Implant Direct has their own STL, or I'm sorry, their own um, scan posts. So if you're scanning in CIREC with an Implant Direct scan post, and they're nice, they're made out of peak, so you don't have to powder them or do whatever. You'll export those file types as the STL file format. Do you put the implant through the guide or with hand? Well, if I can, I put it through the guide. Now, we gotta be careful here because there's different systems with Implant Direct. So the legacy system, we don't have a guided, um, uh, mount for for CIREC I2 or for anything else. So if it's a legacy 2, I still stick it through the guide, but realize we don't have any sort of depth control or angulation control. Now, if you are using the interactive implant, one little known fact is that the NP and the RP sleeves fit CIREC guide perfectly. So if you buy, don't buy the Nobel Active guided sleeves, but you can buy the um, Nobel Replace conical mount um, guided implant mounts. So don't buy the large platform, just the um, NP and the RP. Um, do you have the steps for all the different topics covered that we can get in printed form? The lecture was very fast. Yes, the lecture was very fast. I had to cover quite a bit. Um, I'm not quite sure if we have a handout. Do we have a handout? I don't know <laughs> if we have a handout. Um, so talk to Implant Direct and see if she has a PDF. I sent her a PDF of my presentation. 
I'm really close to purchasing a Form 2 printer. I have a Galeos and an Omnicam in office. You talked about a Moon Lab printer. What's the difference? And should I look closer at Moon Lab? Well, hey, I got to tell you, um, it's like comparing BMW to Mercedes. So the Form and the Moon Ray are both great printers. And I have both in my office. Um, I personally prefer the Moon Ray just because it's faster. It's three, two to three times as fast. The resins are cheaper. Um, and it's just, a, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a lower cost long term to maintain. Now, that's a trade off because the Form 2 printer is just a no brainer printer. It's the easiest printer ever to use. So um, if you go either way, it's probably fine. Um, that being said, Form two, or the Moonray uses DLP technology, which is a projector that cures the resin. Most labs are using DLP. So I just look to what labs use, and I personally like the Moonray better. However, uh, Form Labs is a great printer. All right, everybody. So that seems to be all the questions. Any more questions? Oh, here it is. Here it is. Hang on a second. I have the Cirac, but instrumentarium cone beam. Can I use the digital images to make the guides? Um, kind of yes and no. So in Cirac, you can export to STL, meaning you can take that Omnicam data and put it into another software. Now that software may be 3D Diagnostics, it may be Anatomage, it may be Blue Sky Plan, but it's not going to be the Galileo software. And if we looked at the questions before, Cirac Guide 2, which is the milled surgical guides, um, does not utilize any data besides Galileo's. All right, guys, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, again, sorry it was a lot of information and a little bit of time, but uh, go to Digital Enamel. I've got thousands of cases up there that you can look at um, on Syrah and Galileo's integration.